Okay, so there's another important concept in uh, learning theory that I want to cover today, which is probably approximately correct learning. Uh, so in this sentence, probably and approximately both mean things and not just that we're being very cautious. Uh, so the question here, so the question we already were asking with the VC dimension is how many training examples do we, ha do we need to have and uh, in order to learn a good function and, and conversely, what can we hope to learn given our number of training examples? The concept of uh, probably approximately correct learning uh, is first that we want the thing we learn to be approximately correct. Approximately correct means that we bound the number of errors we make, uh, or rather the probability of error. So the probability of, me, of making an error is bounded by epsilon. And uh, the probably means that we bound this error in most cases. Uh, so the probability of bounding this, uh, this probability of making an error uh, is uh, at least one minus, <coughs> sorry, here, one minus delta. So we're looking at a probability of a probability. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, uh, something to manipulate uh, with caution. Uh, and sometimes it makes your head, your head, your head hurt, but uh, it's, hopefully it's going to make sense. So we want the probability of making an error to be bounded by epsilon. Uh, and there's a typo on the slide that's more than uh, one minus delta. Sorry, it's behind uh, the thing. Uh, I'll fix the slide. Um, okay, so in practice, what does this mean? Uh, I'll try to walk you through an example, still considering uh, axis aligned <coughs> rectangle to show you the kind of things that are being done uh, in uh, theoretical machine learning. Um, and to understand how it is that we can sometimes, for some classes of problems, get guarantees about the number of examples that uh, we should have uh, to be able to learn given a, uh, given a certain hypothesis space. Um, okay, so let's consider our problem, uh, our still our axis align uh, problem, we're still separating the blue points from the orange points, and let's consider our hypothesis to be the most specific hypothesis, so the one that's uh, tied <coughs> to the blue points, to the positive example. So, uh, I'm going to start by doing is, uh, so we have, so given that uh, our data is nice, we have this uh, so if C is a true class, we know that our tightest fit is included in the true class. Does that make sense for everybody? The true class is between, has all the positive examples inside and all the negatives outside. So if I'm tight to the uh, positive example, I'm inside the true class. Okay, so making an error means putting a positive example uh, in between H and C, right? So I'm going to uh, say, I'm, we're going to be thinking uh, in strips. So I'm going to build strips here. So we have four such strips. Uh, they are overlapping, but we're trying to bounce things. So it's okay to be a bit uh, loose. What I'm saying is that if the probability for a positive example, so x positive, to fall, <coughs> Uh, within either of those strips is lower than epsilon over four, <coughs> we're happy. So we have a bit of overlap, but if this probability is lower than epsilon over four, uh, so in this strip, uh, and this strip equivalently, and this strip equivalently, and this one equivalently, 
then the probability of making a mistake is lower than epsilon. I'm going to define t. Uh, I'm going to look at the top strip. And I'm going to define t as a top strip such, such that in C, so I don't care about h at the moment, uh, so such that the probability of putting a positive example in that strip is exactly <coughs> epsilon over 4. So t is the upper strip such as a probability for a posit positive example x, x, uh, to <coughs> be in that strip is exactly epsilon over 4. So then I have two possibilities. Either that strip is wider than uh, my top strip here, here, or it's narrower. I mean, or it's the same size, but... Uh, so we have two scenarios. One, uh, so t is wider, sorry, narrower. So t is here, that's t. Uh, and h is below. So the probability here, uh, so for related to h, uh, that a positive example falls in the top strip. So what can we say about this probability? So this, the probability for x to fall here is exactly epsilon over 4. So now the probability of being in the upper strip here is bigger. Uh, so this is bigger than epsilon over 4. Uh, conversely, if in the other scenario <coughs> where t uh, covers h, so the scenario where we have this, then the probability to be between h and c is smaller than epsilon over 4, and that's the situation we want. So we're not going to worry about that. We're going to worry about this scenario. That's a scenario we don't want to happen. OK, when does the scenario happen? It happens if I have a training example, if I have no training example, examples that are in T. So because H is tight to T, if I had a positive example here, then H would come here, and then I would be in that situation. So. The bad scenario um, happens when uh, no training point <coughs> is in T. OK, so probability of the, so the, so let's take one training point. So I take one point, uh, <coughs> it's positive, so it's inside C. Um, the probability that this point is not in T is, by definition in T, <coughs> 1 minus epsilon over 4. So T is defined as a strip such that the probability for an example to fall in that strip is epsilon over 4. So the probability for an example to fall outside that strip is 1 minus epsilon over 4. So, so the probability for, for one training point of this bad scenario happening is 1 minus epsilon over 4. Now I have n training points. I'm assuming those training points are independent from one another because this is what you always assume, assume in machine learning, and it's not true in real life, but we're assuming that we, they are completely independent from one another. So then the probability, sorry, I'm going to have to back here. The probability f of this happening for n turning point is uh, so 1 minus epsilon over 4 
to the power of n. Okay, we're almost done. So that was the probability of this scenario one happening for the top strip. Now we have four such possible scenarios. The top strip, the right strip, the bottom strip, and the left strip. So the probability, <laughs> so you know that, I mean, there's some overlap, so to be uh, <coughs> cautious, we'll use the union, the union rule, which is a rule that tells you that the probability of A union B is lower than the probability of A plus the probability of B. And we'll apply it to uh, four things, so A, B, C, D, uh, scenario, bad scenario in the top strip, bad scenario in the right strip, bad scenario in the left strip, and bad scenario in, sorry, bottom and left. So then the probability of a bad scenario overall, uh, I'll overload this, is lower than four times this. Okay, so what we said is that we didn't want the scenario happening more than delta times. So we want to bound this by delta, <coughs> this probability by delta. So good scenario uh, bounded, so lower bounded by one minus delta <coughs> equals bad scenario upper bounded by delta. Uh, before doing this, I'm going to use uh, one uh, small trick, which is to say that uh, one minus <coughs> x is lower than exponential minus x, uh, at least between zero and one. You can do a little drawing of one minus x and exponential minus x to convince yourself of that. Um, so four times one minus epsilon over four to the n is bounded by four times uh, exponential <coughs> minus n epsilon over 4. So I've used x equals epsilon over 4, and I've used that exponential of something to the power of n is exponential of n times that something. Uh, so now I'm going to bound this by delta. If I bound this by delta, then I bound this by delta, then I bound my probability of bad scenario by, de by delta. Uh, so we have, so we want that four exponential minus n epsilon over four is bounded by delta. Uh, so we do some, uh, some mass which consists in dividing by four, taking the log and shuffling signs around. And in the end, we arrive to something that regards n. Because remember, the whole question is, what can we say about n uh, that guarantees us that given epsilon and delta, we are probably approximately correct. So if I haven't made any mistake, it looks <coughs> fine. Uh, this is equivalent to the equation in blue here, which tells you that n must be greater, greater than 4 over epsilon log of 4 over delta. Uh, it's not very tight because we've made a number of simplifications, but uh, if n is greater, greater than 4 over epsilon log, over, log of 4 over delta, uh, then I can guarantee that uh, in more than 1 minus delta, uh, of the cases, the error is bounded by epsilon. Um, so there's two interesting things to note about this. Um, the first one is that if I want to increase my accuracy, so I want to make uh, mistakes uh, very rarely, it means that I need to lower epsilon. If I lower epsilon, then 4 over epsilon increases, and the lower bound for n increases, so I need more training examples. Uh, <coughs> similarly, if I want a greater confidence, so I want to be sure that uh, this 
probability, this bounding of the probability of error happens in most cases, I need to lower delta um, so that this gets closer to one. Uh, so if I lower delta, this quantity also increases, which also means that I mean need more training examples. And I guess this is uh, consistent with the intuition you have, or at least that you should be developing right about now, which is that the more training data you have and the better you'll be at learning. So, you know, given this hypothesis space, the more points I add to the space and the more I'll narrow the possibilities for H and then the better H will be. Does that make sense? So maybe not the whole probability, probabilis, probabilities uh, demonstration, but uh, does the conclusion we draw from it make sense? And the difference between accuracy and confidence. Those are also two important concepts. So you want to be sure you're not making many mistakes most of the time. So I think that was the tough part of this lecture.